rare metals, which trades on the OTCQX under the symbol UURAF and on the TSXV under the symbol UCU, who previous, previously shared their business plans to reestablish a much needed Western supply chain for rare earths. Their technology is known as Rapid SX, and both Canadian and U.S. governments have invested in running many hours at their commercial demo plant as they prepare for commercialization. Happy to welcome back CEO Pat Ryan. Hi, Pat. Welcome today. We're looking forward to hearing your update. Yeah, thanks very much. And we do have a few updates, uh, one that was substantial last week, but uh, we'll just give a quick generally uh, industry overview, too. I think everyone realizes that there's still a lot of talk about rare earth in the news. Uh, most recently, there was a, a truce between China and the U.S. in Geneva, and it rolled tariffs back from 145 percent back to 30 uh, percent and from 125 percent back to 10 percent. But that did not affect the rare earth landscape. And we'll, we'll stroll forward and talk about that a little bit here. Cautionary notes, disclaimers, of course. Um, the supply chain, just wanted to go back and remind everyone, this is the rare earth supply chain. So on the far right, um, or at the far left, you have uh, up and coming rare earth mines around the world that are non-Chinese, because uh, we're looking at the non-Chinese Western world developing uh, rare earth supply chain, which is very much needed for many applications uh, that are critically held by, uh, by China right now, in particular with emerging industries. But there are num numerous resources around the world. Uh, they're in Australia, they're in South America, they're in Eastern Africa, they're in the Far East, not China, but areas like Vietnam. And UCOR is working with those companies to allow their rare, rare concentrate, rare earth concentrate, to make its way into that mid-market, which is where the separation of the individual rare earth elements happens, where you get the rare earth oxides or chlorides. And that separation is a very technically challenging, difficult uh, assignment. It needs good tech and it needs a lot of um, smart engineering. And that's what we've been working on for the past four years as we acquired Innovation Metals Corp back in May of 2020. They had a very unique technology where the existing chemistry used to separate out rare earth oxides could be made much more effective with a column-based technology, which is what we're using, a column-based technology in order to um, uh, separate out the rare earth oxides. So that mid-market is very important. That's the part that's missing in the Western world. In order to bridge the up-and-coming mines on the left with the downstream alloy and magnet makers, that, that's where the key is. And in fact, it's been identified most recently by the U.S. government that in order to solve this problem for the U.S. and for the Western world, money has to go into the processing and refining in order to move it forward. On the far right, you have the magnet makers and the alloy metal makers. The magnet makers are primarily in Japan right now. There are a couple in, uh, or one in particular in Europe. They're starting to set up shop in, uh, in the U.S., but it'll take a little bit before we finally get there. But they need the inputs, and in particular, they need the heavy rare earth inputs. You may recall last time we spoke about light rare earth and heavy rare earth. And the heavy rare earth is what's needed in order to make a permanent magnet. It'll help it hold its um, magnetization at very high temperatures. And the, um, the use of the permanent magnet goes into, uh, well, it's converting electrical energy into mechanical energy. It's the most efficient means. There's no replacement for it. And uh, we're looking at things like EV, EV motors that get hot, wind turbines where two tons of permanent magnets go into a wind turbine, defense applications like F-35 fighters, um, as well as robotics. By 2035, robotics will be the largest user of permanent magnets. And you may have heard some news about Elon Musk and his uh, quest to get permanent magnets from China. Scrolling forward. Uh, I think I lost my tab here. Um, trying to scroll to the next slide. Oh, there we go. Never mind. Okay. Um, yeah, geopolitical hot potato. We talked about this last time, but the two updates are the last two bullet points on this slide. So on April 15th, which was just after, or just on the day that we had the last emerging growth conference, um, there was an executive order that came out. It was essentially a, a 232 investigation, which said that um, we're going to take a look at the, uh, uh, the market in the Western world, the U.S. primarily. We're going to figure out where the gaps are, figure out where there are opportunities, figure out where the um, manipulation of the market might be happening, see what our resources are, uh, are, and learn how to accelerate so we can solve this problem quite quickly. Now, that's a heck of an assignment because China has a 30-year you know, advantage on everything in the Western world. But nonetheless, UCOR did submit uh, somewhere around April 17th a plan to maximize our assets, one being the commercial demonstration plant in Kingston, and talking about how we could potentially speed up the development there as well as uh, Louisiana and the execution of our full-scale commercial plant and what we could do to speed up that execution. Then around um, May the 11th, that's when the uh, truce and the uh, talks happened in Geneva. But the important thing here is when that happened, 
uh, China did not let up on their rare earth controls. There may be a truce in place, but on rare earth, they are not letting that grip go. In fact, of the 50 critical minerals that are out there, and they control 30 of them very, very effectively, they're not letting a grip go on any of that. So that's still very much a high-stake card that's on the table. And keep in mind, too, that the what they've done is they've banned seven critical rare earths. Uh, they include, um, uh, you know, things like uh, terbium and uh, dysprosium that are heavy rare earths that are not available in the Western world. Uh, they also include uh, samarium, used in samarium cobalt uh, magnets for F-35 fighters and other military applications. Uh, gadolinium, used in nuclear reactors, and then a couple of others that are very uh, crucial to uh, the path forward. Reminding everyone, these are the assets that UCOR has. We have a commercial demonstration plant in Kingston. We've been running thousands of hours at this plant in order to develop the technology for commercialization. And what you see on the right is the commercial demo plant that will be copy and pasting our technology from the left side of this screen into the right. And that will be happening in 2026. The big news since we last met um, is uh, coming up here shortly. This is a map that shows how the product will flow. We'll have inputs coming from outside the US South America as rock, rare earth concentrate, coming from the Far East as concentrate, Australia as concentrate into Louisiana, and then shipping back out to magnet makers in Japan, metal makers in uh, South Korea, metal makers in the UK, and a couple of others that we're working uh, offtake relationships with uh, right now. And we'll hear more about uh, those offtakes uh, in the uh, months ahead. Um, and then moving forward further here, if I can scroll further, there seems to be a, an issue. Come on. Can't seem to get, uh, there we go. Okay, yeah, big news. This was the uh, the big news. The big news was that last week, the US DOD, and we have a program with them, we're running $4 million of uh, just runtime. It's a $4 million US program, but they stepped up and said, this technology is really showing um, the uh, metrics and the deliverables that we need. We will invest an additional 18.4 million. It's a grant. And essentially they've said is, Go ahead, continue your engineering and build your first production line in Louisiana. In fact, build the infrastructure for three production lines and we'll build and we'll fund also the first production line going into this facility. So 18.4 million was funded by the US DOD. Uh, we have confidence uh, that there, there could be additional funding coming up, but that was a big step forward to allow this to uh, take hold for the company. And then, uh, Next here, as I continue to struggle with scrolling forward. Well, there's some near-term drivers I can't seem to get to. I don't know why. Oh, here we go. Near-term drivers, uh, just ending on this note, and then we'll take a couple of questions. Again, there may be additional funds beyond the $4 million. Uh, We have lots of relationship developing on the offtake world. The 18.4 may be met with additional funding. Recall I mentioned that we submitted on... Uh, uh, based on the 232 investigation, we submitted our accelerated plan for Kingston and for Louisiana. There could be additional funding coming that uh, we would hear about. Um, and other um, feasibility study advancements as we work towards first mover production in Louisiana. So very, uh, very substantial for the company. I'll, I'll stop there. All right, Pat, let's jump into some questions for you. Uh, let's see, the latest news on the further 18.4 million investment from the DOD is pretty substantial. So talk about the timing to execute that. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So we're looking at uh, getting at the infrastructure for the first three production lines in Louisiana completed by the first half of 2026. We're looking to have that first production line to go within that infrastructure of three production lines again in the first half of 26 and maybe a little quicker if the DOD steps up and says uh, we actually have additional funding to accelerate further and that would be based on the 232 investigation so first part of 26 first mover the key here is we're going to be pr uh, processing and refining heavy rare earth and could this be more future support from the DOD well yeah the current program's under IBAS so the, the 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 further program would be under DOD but absolutely it would be under this 232 investigation so the IBAS program that we're currently working under which saw an extension it's called no TA could see additional funding now coming from the 232 investigation so yeah multiple opportunities here and how are your rare earth feedstock discussions progressing and are you concerned about tariffs uh, yeah, no, the feedstock uh, discussions are going very well. In fact, we had a, a very good uh, discussion late last night with one of our uh, feedstock opportunities, and uh, we're looking to sign an agreement with them very shortly. You'll hear about some of that coming up. 
But uh, yeah, from Australia to Eastern Africa to South America, which is very promising, and the Far East, we have at least two feedstocks that'll be uh, made available for Louisiana. Not concerned about the tariffs presently because the um, uh, Louisiana facility happens to be in a foreign trade zone. I think we touched on this last time we spoke. A foreign trade zone is a handful of areas in the U.S. where you can actually bring inputs from outside the country into the U.S., process into final products, ship it back out of the U.S., and there's no tariff consequence. It's something that was developed during the uh, World War II era, and um, it, they exist still today. And uh, Alexandria, Louisiana, where we are, happens to be a foreign trade zone, helps us with the tariff battle. Fascinating. All right, Pat, thank you so much for this update, and we look forward to hearing more from you in the future. Yeah, thank you very much for this opportunity. All right, everyone, we'll be right back.